Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a preview video uh, of our special feature for insider subscribers at ClassicsToday.com, the 10 best recordings, in this case of Lauren Mazel. And this is going to be, I think, one of the more interesting in this series for a number of reasons, which I'm going to discuss now. However, I do want to suggest that if you have not yet subscribed to ClassicsToday.com as an insider, please consider doing so. This series is going like gangbusters. There's all kinds of nifty insider content, including reviews of all of those big boxes and things, all with sound clips so you can sample the stuff, the stuff that I can't put here on YouTube. It's all over there, and it's just waiting for you to enjoy it. So do please give it a thought. I uh, have put a link to the ClassicsToday.com subscription, subscription page at the bottom of this particular video in the description of the video, or you can just find it in the middle in a prominent place on the ClassicsToday.com homepage. So thank you very, very much for your consideration. We really appreciate the support. It's allowing us to do this, to do the written reviews and the videos and all of the stuff that we're doing. And so we need you. We need you to participate. So let's talk now about Lauren Mazel. This has been one of the most curious and difficult of all of the talks I've put together to try and find his 10 best recordings because Mazel, Mazel was like the great second rate conductor. And I don't mean that in a bad sense. There's no question. You know, you know there, there's this sort of round robin, you may have noticed this, of major, major posts for for the big conductors you know they get a couple big orchestras in america and then they get one or two in europe and then and then they get the vienna state opera which nobody gets for very long because nobody could tolerate it or get along with the pushy intendant and the politics and the bullshit that goes on in vienna but everybody gets that job for a couple of years lauren mazo among them you know he it's like a musical chairs and there's this limited number of high-powered conductors who just, you know, alamand right, as PDQ Bach would say. They just shift to the right and they move from post to post to post to post um, in a sort of revolving door arrangement. And Mazel was one of those. But the funny thing about him, I mean, he was around forever. He made piles and piles of recordings for every single label. I mean, there's a box of stuff on Deutsche Gramophone. There's a box on Sony. There's a box on Decca. There's a box on EMI. He recorded with all the major orchestras. He made recordings in Vienna. He made recordings in Berlin. He did recordings with the New York Philharmonic. He did recordings in Pittsburgh. He did recordings in Cleveland. He did things everywhere. And it, it, it really is amazing how little, any, how little of it anyone cares about. That's what's so interesting, because Mazel, Mazel was, well, let's, let's start at the beginning. He was really a child prodigy, a brilliant, brilliant, freakishly brilliant musical mind. He started conducting when he was like, I don't know, in the womb. He was very, very young. He had, by general consent, the most perfect conducting technique of anyone out there. And I saw him many times, and I, I can attest to that. He was very, very interesting to watch because he had the entire work in his baton and in his left hand. He had control of all of it. He was a violinist by training. He fancied himself a composer. There was a very funny moment when he was making tons and tons and tons of recordings for, for RCA, then BMG, um, at that point in his career, where he said he was going to take a year off to satisfy the demand for his compositions. And everybody just looked around and said, what demand? Who even knew he was a composer? And they actually recorded a disc of his orchestral stuff, which nobody cared about. They may have sold one copy to Mrs. Mazel, his mother, if she were still around. And it was really kind of astonishing. And he, he did everything that everyone else did. That was, that was the weird thing. I mean, you know, he, he had no, it was impossible to tell from his discography what he was really good at. He wasn't really bad at anything. 
He could do anything. He had this, like I said, this fabulous technique. He always got the orchestra to sound good. He, he, he would conduct anything in that romantic repertoire. The one thing he never had any feeling for or did any of was Mozart, Haydn, the classical period. With Mazel, life began with Beethoven, basically. Basically. And, and it went on from there. Perhaps his, his specialty was, was, you know, the Russian romantics and maybe, maybe the early 20th century composers, you know, in that, in that realm. But, but like I said, everybody else did that stuff. I mean, he made two Sibelius cycles, one of which, the Vienna one for Decca, is acknowledged as one of the finer ones that's ever been made, and it is. He did a Tchaikovsky cycle in Vienna. He did, he did all of the basic repertoire. He did his Beethoven cycle for Sony in Cleveland, which no one particularly cared about. He did a Brahms cycle in Cleveland, which by general acknowledgement was not as good as either the, the George Sell or the Dohnani that came later, also with Cleveland. Where do you place him? It's very, very difficult. He got, I think, his, his multiferous jobs because of his, his, his sheer talent, and it was talent, his podium ability, his technical polish, his ability to get the job done, and because of his enormous range of repertoire within the, the, the standard large orchestra you know, sort of conventional, canonic, classical repertoire. He did all of that stuff. He did all of it more or less well. But, and here's the but, this is the interesting thing. There was something about his personality that I think was just slightly off. What I mean by that is, I don't mean like he was like disturbed. They're all disturbed. What I mean is, what I mean is, interpretively, he could be absolutely fabulous one day and absolutely dreadful the next. But it was not the kind of dreadful that comes from sloppiness or slovenliness or incompetence. It was the kind of dreadful it came from an excess of control and a, a desire to do something that was just somehow, somehow antithetical to the way the music wanted to go. He had, he had a certain reptilian coolness, I think. I mean, again, that doesn't sound very nice, does it? But it's very, very strange. He could be going like gangbusters, and then all of a sudden you hit a passage where something just bizarre happens, and you can't figure it out. But he always executed it perfectly because it was always intentional. You felt, you felt the, the gears whirling in the way that he did these things. There wasn't anything that seemed haphazard or inadvertent. And I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. One of his finer recordings, which is not on my list, by the way, is his Prokofiev Fifth Symphony with the Cleveland Orchestra. There are marvelous things about that performance. It is superbly played. The first movement, Coda with the tam-tam, goes great. But there's a moment in the first movement, and those of you who know the Prokofiev Fifth will know the moment I'm talking about. It's at the end of the exposition where all of a sudden Prokofiev asked that the tempo speed up. And, you know, it's, it's right after the lyrical theme and it's going, bum, 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 ba, da, 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 Right? The end of the exposition, it's that, that chattering, chattering little cadence theme in the violins. Everybody gets it right. Everybody speeds up a little to give it that, that chattering character, the right character that Prokofiev intended, not Mazel. He is absolutely strict. It's da, 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 And you just listen to it, you go, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's he doing there? Why? What's the point? It's, it's contrary to what, to what the composer asked for, and it's contrary to what the music seems to demand, and he's executing it weirdly but beautifully. This is true of a lot of his Mahler. This is true of oh, many other performances. The Rite of Spring, that's another famous one. I saw him conduct it with the London Symphony at the Barbican Center, and, and it, it, it was just one of those very, very odd things. He made several recordings of the Rite of Spring. It was one of his, you know, I mean, he did it, and he, he had such a musical memory. He had the whole work in his head and his fingertips. 
But at the moment before the Stegosaurus battle in part two, you know, where the, where the orchestra, the timpani are all pounding, going, fum, 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 fum. You know, I mean, the tempo is supposed to take off like a shot. And he notoriously, this is true in all of his recordings, slowed down hugely. Just fum, fum, fum. It's effective, actually. I kind of liked it. But it wasn't what Stravinsky wanted. And that was, that was his thing. That was his thing. When he, when he decided to do something, you always had the sense that he was doing it because it was willful on his part, but it didn't have much to do with the music he was actually conducting. It was a strange thing, a really strange thing. Some of his performances, were, like I said, were stunning. Others were not. And he re recorded and re-recorded and re-re-recorded. I mean, he did Richard Strauss tone poems three or four times. Who knows? How many times? And some of them are marvelous. Some of them are absolutely marvelous. But at the end of the day, you know, one of the things that has made this job a little easier is the fact that a lot of his stuff has been boxed up. There's a big Deutsche Grammophon box, there's a Decca box, there's a Sony box, there's a, you know, a couple Decca boxes, there's a Vienna box, there's a, you know, Cleveland box. So his career has been compartmentalized by the record labels in a most helpful way. But when you look at it and you see all the duplication and all the stuff that he's done, that he did, and how little of it we still talk about how few recordings of his are reference recordings. Remember when I, I did, just did the London Bernstein talk? I was, no time at all I was able to choose 10 recordings that were all reference recordings in the repertoire in question. In fact, it was hard to limit myself to 10. That was the hard part with Bernstein. With Mazel, it's just the opposite. There's lots of good stuff. I mean, some very good stuff, some outstanding stuff. But how many of them are reference recordings? I, there are some. There are some, and, and I believe I've included them in my list. But I, I think that it's really astonishing. And so, and so I'm left with, you, you see someone's life encapsulated in these boxes, and you wonder, what, 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 what were they thinking when they made all of these recordings with him? Did people really buy them? Who? Who bought them? And... And what did they think of them? I, I can't think of one time in all of my years when I, with my colleagues, when we were talking about the, the best recordings of works or even favorite recordings of works, where people say, ah, you know, I want to go and listen to that Mazel record. And that's just fate. However gifted, however talented, however brilliant he was, there were other people out there who had bigger names. I'm not saying that they were necessarily better. They were just, there was something, and for whatever reason, they were better known, and they had identifiable, identifiable repertoire preferences so that you could say, if you're going to listen to a Mahler symphony, you'd say, oh, I'm going to listen to Bernstein, or I'm going to listen to Schulte. It doesn't matter how good or bad it was. They made their names doing that. What did you listen to where you said, oh, I have to listen to Mazel among all of the options I have for that particular repertoire? Very, very, very strange. And so for that reason, he, he flew a little bit under the radar. But at the end of the day, when you look at the unbelievably huge investment that the record labels made in his work, um, I, you just scratch your head and say, you know, here, there, I can scratch my head. There we go. And say, what, what were they thinking? What, what is that? What is it about this guy? That is the question that I hope to answer in the insider subscriber video on the 10 best recordings of Maestro Lauren Mazel. So I do hope you become an insider member if you're not already, and you join me over there, and let's see what they are, and let's see if there's any kind of pattern or sense we can make of it. I, I, it's, it really is a, an interesting question, very, very interesting question in the history of modern music on recordings and the major conductors who made them, because make no mistake, he was a major conductor and he made a lot of recordings. So keep on listening, folks. Thank you so much for joining me for this Lauren Mazel special over at Classics Today and for this preview, which I still think, as I said before, these are all standalone videos. I think they, they ask some very interesting questions and they should get you thinking. 
so we can still have a talk over here if you're not an Insider member. But I think you'll have more fun if you are. Take care.